Hello, this is Pastor Jeff. We want to thank you for joining us for this online worship experience. I hope you're blessed by this word today. And if you want to know more about Hope Church, you can visit us at this website below me, realchurchforrealpeople.com. I come on one thing, the same God that never fails, and I'll fail on me. Jeremiah 29 11. That is one of my favorite scriptures of all time. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. And see, we sang about it here this morning about, you know, we have hope in Jesus and he keeps hope alive. And the reason why we have hope is because we rest in the palm of his hand. See, he is the potter and we are nothing but the clay. <laughs> and see, what's so great is the potter will take something that 
looks ugly, looks unworthy, looks not righteous at all. Is not Someone would look at it and think, this is worthless. And what he does is he crafts it and he molds it and he starts to cut away. And he starts to mold this here and a little bit there until it becomes the masterpiece that he creates. Amen. I'm so happy I serve a God who is an artist. I'm so happy I serve a God who is a potter who can take what nobody else can see and can make beautiful things. But he only will do that if you let him. God will never force himself on you. So he will only do that if you accept him and let him do it. Amen. Let's continue just to worship him in this house.
Jesus. See, I don't care what you've done in your life. As long as you still got my back in your love, keep on finish with you. He can take the most broken, messed up situations and come to life for his glory. And he's, I know he's getting us all right. songs growing up uh, when I was in youth group just a couple years ago, or maybe more than that, but yeah, was a just a few, yeah, 24, I got you, yeah, uh, but I love the song, uh, Potter's Hand, because it says about take me and mold me and shape me and, and make me, basically it's saying make me what you want me to be. Yes. See, God wants to mold us, God wants to make us into what he wants us to be. But the question I have for you today, and I want you to ponder as we go through this message, are you moldable? Are you pliable? Are you completely subject to the potter's will? Are you able to say, God, if there's things in me that need taken out, remove it. If there's things that need burned out, purify me in the fire. Mold me and make me to be what you want me to be. I give my life to the potter's hand. Right. Do what you want to do with me. And when you pray that, understand he will do that. He will work on you. He will mold you. He will make you into what he wants you to be. Writer Henry Blackaby said this, When God assignments demands humility, he finds a servant willing to be humble. When it requires zeal, he looks for someone he can feel with his spirit. God uses holy vessel, vessels, so he finds those who allow him. Everybody say allow him. Allow him, allow him to remove their impurities. It is, it is not a noble task being clay. There is no glamour to it. Nothing boasts worthy except it's exactly what God is looking for. Yes. He's looking for clay. Yes. Yes. And if you want to be that clay and say, Lord, mold me, make me to be what you would have me to be. We're going to go over to the book of Jeremiah. I want you to stick with me because there's going to be a little bit of a lengthy reading, but that we're going somewhere, so just stick with me for a moment. But if you have your Bibles, go over to Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. And I want you to think about this. Is your heart moldable? Is your heart pliable? Some of us, we're just molding. That's why we need to put back in the fire. That's why we need to be put on the potter's wheel. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah 18. Go ahead and read if you could, uh, Brady, the first, uh, let's say, six verses of this. The, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Our God, let me stop there. God is still speaking to men of God. Amen. Amen. God is still giving words. God is still delivering words yeah. through the pulpit. Amen. Yeah. And I get sick and tired of people says, I don't need the church. I'm leaving the church. Let me just put it bluntly. You may disagree with this. I think you're going to have a hard time making it into heaven without being part of a church. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Because I don't know what Bible you read, but my Bible says he's coming back for his bride and the bride is the church. Amen. Yeah. 
Anyway, go ahead. God was speaking to Jeremiah. I'll try not to cut you off too many times. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my word. He said, Arise and go to the potter's house. Where is the potter's house? Let me give you a clue. You're sitting in it right now. This is the potter's house. This is the church. And he said, When you go to the potter's house, you're going to receive a word. Sometimes we stay away from church for so long that we wonder why we never hear anything from God. It's because you better be in the potter's house if you want to hear from the potter. Amen? Go on. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. Oh, he's working. So guess what God does in his church? He works. He works. He works from that corner to that corner to that corner to that corner. Even right now in the nursery, he's working. Even right now in the kids' church, he's working. God is working in this place because when you come to the potter's house, he's busy working. Go ahead. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. I pray that God sends us marred vessels. What does that mean? That's people that are damaged, that are hurting. But look what the potter does. He makes it anew. Come on. You're here today because you came to him marred, sin stained. But guess what the potter did? He said, I'm going to take you and place you in my hand. I'm going to mold you and make you to be what I want you to be. Amen? Yes. Created me to clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. Yes. Our God is a creator. Yes. Come on. Just look around at all the different funny people he created. <laughs> We're all different and unique. Come on, don't take yourself too seriously. You got to be willing to laugh at yourself. Amen? Amen. We're all God's creation. How boring would we be if we all were the same? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be around me all the time. Imagine if everybody was like me. It would just be a boring, dull world. Like We wouldn't have no fun, right? Let's go a little deeper. Go ahead. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, oh, where, was that stop? where was Jeremiah when the Lord was speaking to him? Make sure you get this. Where was he at? He's in the potter's, He's in the potter's house. house. Where is he at? He's in the church. He's in the potter's house. All right. So the Lord spoke to him. Go ahead. O house of Israel, can I not do this with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look at the clay is in the potter's hands. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. God is always reaching. God is always trying to get a hold of you, to try to mold you and make you to be what he wants you to be. And God will never stop reaching. As long as you breathe that he's reaching. As long as you have life in your body, he's reaching for you. And he said, oh, house of Israel, this is what I want to do. I want to take you and I want to mold you and make you to be what I want you to be. Now go over to Jeremiah, the 19th chapter. Go ahead and read that uh, first two verses of that. Thus says the Lord, go and get a potter's earthen flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests. Go ahead. And go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entrance of the pot shared gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you. So Jeremiah in the 18th chapter, he's at the potter's house. And now all of a sudden there's a transition as you read through this. All of a sudden in the 19th chapter, he's telling them, I want you to go to this place and pronounce judgment. That's scary. It is. How many times I see people that they walk out the doors or walk away from God. And when you do that, you open yourself up and you become deceived and Satan works and he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's telling Jeremiah, I want you to go to this valley of Hinnom. And this is the place where the potter's field is. And he said, I want you to proclaim judgment. And Jeremiah did just that. He went there. He proclaimed judgment. We're going to read about it in a minute. But I want you to understand, this place was the potter's field, not the house. Somebody say, I'm in the house, house. not the field. (laughs) There's a parallel here, and I want to show you. I love how the Bible just fits all together. Because this field that Jeremiah prophesied over shows up again in Scripture, in the book of Matthew. This was the field that was purchased by blood money. 
Watch this, Matthew 27. Go ahead and start reading the first verse and the third verse of Matthew 27. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Now, if those of you are new here understand, Judas was the one who betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And his guilt was killing him. And here he is, he has the 30 pieces of silver he betrayed Christ with. And, and all of a sudden, here he is in the scripture and he's talking about something. So go ahead, just keep going. With saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. So here's Judas. He went and says, here, take your money back. I betrayed him. And they said, there's nothing we can do now. So he threw the silver down in the temple. All right. And he went and his guilt killed him. Let me just stop here and tell you, don't let the enemy ruin your life. Yes. One mistake doesn't define you. That's right. One accident doesn't define you. Listen, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of his glory. I heard a story this week where a minister's son made a big mistake. And instead of him coming and letting the church gather around him and pray for him and lead him to repentance, his embarrassment caused him to kill himself. Have we become that as a church where people are not can't even come in and bear their scars to us and show their sin without feeling judged? Without feeling like we're throwing stones at them? Judas got to the point that he thought there was no hope. And I wonder, what if he would have paid closer attention to the messages of Christ? What if he was willing to get back his broken, shattered self on the potter's well and say, God, mold me? What type of testimony would he be able to deliver? What type of sermons would he be able to preach to say, I was the one who betrayed him, but God changed my life? What kind of message would he be able to share? What kind of life would he be able to live? What type of example would he be able to be? But instead, he became shattered and the potter's failed right. because of his guilt. Lord, let people come in this place that are shattered and broken. And Lord, we want to encourage them. Get your life in the potter's hand and he will mold you and make you to be what he wants you to be. So he threw down the 30 pieces of silver. Go ahead. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Good. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Watch verse number 9. We just talked about Jeremiah. Watch this. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying... And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. I'm amazed at the consistency and how the Bible all pieced together. Here, this was the same, very same place Jeremiah stood and proclaimed destruction. Here it is all these years later, the place that was purchased by blood money. See how this all fits together in Scripture? When God... When, when God told Jeremiah to pronounce destruction, this place was that. It became a place of desolation and destruction. It became a potter's field where things that are broken. It basically was a cemetery. And it was bought by blood money. Mm -hmm. Judas' blood money. And if you go back to Jeremiah, the, the 19th chapter, go ahead and just read verses 6. because this, this was Jeremiah's prophecy over that area, this valley of Hennon, which is the potter's field. Watch what he says. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the sons of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. And I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpses I will give as meat for the birds of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth. I will make this city desolate and a hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hiss because of all of the plagues 
Now this is Old Testament, but this is heavy stuff, and I hope you're understanding, and I hope I'm communicating. Are you getting what I'm saying? All right. I'm communicating right away. Jeremiah was called by God. The man who was just in the, in the potter's house was called to go to this field and pronounce destruction. And here is the words of Jeremiah, pronounce destruction upon this place. And all these years later, we see Judas with the money, this blood money was purchased, purchased this field. This is pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Yes. How it all fits together here. Go to Jeremiah 19. Just read the 10th verse. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Even so I will break this people in this city as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet till there is no place to bury. He said, I'm going to take and those who don't want to be on the potter's well are going to be destroyed in the potter's field. So I asked you a question. Do you want to be in the potter's house? Or do you want to be in the field? I want to be in his house. Because let me put it another way. The potter's house can represent heaven. I believe that. And the potter's field represents eternal separation, a place called hell. There are people that are going to the potter's field every day that are being shattered every day. And I'm here to tell you, and I'll just say it right now, if you don't know Jesus, he can pick you up out of that field and place you back on the wheel today. Amen? I said he can pick you up out of that field and place you back on that wheel. And he can begin to mold you and make you. Are you pliable? Are you moldable? Are you letting him work for you or not? The choice is yours. And I wonder, like, at what at what instant did God all of a sudden, you know, when do we allow, how do we allow ourselves to be taken from the house to the field? Why do we allow ourselves to be taken from the house to the field? And when you read this, this story, there are some things that you can pick up here. Because basically they got to the point that these people didn't want to hear from the man of God no more. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. They didn't want to hear the good news of, of, of the prophet. You know, we like to think these prophets were always valued and appreciated. No, they were feared. And a lot of times when they saw the prophet come, they would go the other way. But sometimes they were ridiculed and mocked also. But I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I moldable? Am I pliable? Am I on the potter's wheel right now? Because I don't care what you've done. You may be in the potter's field right now, but if you let him pick you up. Jacob was a liar and deceiver, but he knew how to get back on the wheel. Yeah. David was a man who was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was a liar. He was a hypocrite. But yet he was somebody that, that wrote, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because he was moldable. He was pliable. Peter was a guy like Judas betrayed Jesus. He denied him three times, but instead of letting the guilt kill him, he paid attention, and he went, and he repented, and he went bitterly and said, I'm getting back on the wheel. Amen? I don't care what you've done. Get back on the wheel. Amen? The enemy will come to try to kill, steal, and destroy. He'll come to try to tell you, you're no good. You messed up. You went too far. If everybody knew what you did, nobody would want to talk to you in church. Nobody would want to shake your head. Don't listen. He is a liar and a father of liars. Get back on the wheel. This is the potter's house. He works on us here. We come here because we need him to be here. We come here because we need him to, to mold us and make us pliable and work on us. Sometimes my vessel gets cracked. Sometimes it gets shattered, but that's okay. He always picks me up and fixes me. Yes. But the choice is always yours. Are you going to let him mold you and make you to be or do you want to be like these people that Jeremiah proclaimed judgment against? And we start to see in the 12th verse of the 18th chapter some of the ways that they were. Go ahead. Verse number 12. And they said, that is hopeless, so we will walk according to our own plans, and we will everyone obey the dictates of his right. evil heart. I will do what I want to do. Right. Now everybody says, you do you. I do me, you do you. No, 
No, you need to do what the Word of God tells you to do. Amen? It says they walked after their own imaginations. And this is the world we're living in now. Yeah. Evil hearts. Do what you want to do. It's your life. Right? It's so interesting how we value life when somebody is, is what we call them. And when actually they're living in the womb and we kill life there. It's amazing. We live in an evil world. We really do. But when you start to see these signs, and that's what I want to give you over the next few minutes, a few signs to look for, even in ourself. We get to the point that it doesn't bother us when we see ignorance and foul things. We accept it. Come on. I remember when they said TV was evil. And you had shows on there like Andy Griffith and stuff. Preachers would stand up and say, these things are evil. Get them out of your house. And we think, this is crazy. Now we look back at that stuff and think, wow, look how far we have disintegrated. Look how far we have come. Look how the morality in this, everything is just stripped away. It's true. Nobody comes to church now to hear that they're called sinners. We've got to come and hear how there's ten ways to better ourselves, and it's all about us. Well, let me tell you, there's still some preachers out there that believe hell is hot, hell is real, and sin is real. And I'm going to tell you, you're a sinner, and you need Jesus. Amen? I'm amazed that the pulpits that no longer will say the S word, sin. Are you serious? Because if the enemy can take what... Our mentioning of sin away. He'll make us think we're doing okay. And then that takes the cross away and the blood away. Come on. Man, I ain't taking the blood away. <laughs> as long as there's breath in this, I'm preaching about the blood of Jesus, and I'm a sinner saved by his grace. Amen. I don't want to walk after my own devices. Go to the 15th verse, read a little bit more. Because my people have forgotten me. Forgotten him. They have burned incense to worthless idols, and they have caused themselves to stumble in their ways. It says they burned incense to worthless idols. We think, well, that don't apply to us. Some of you put everything before God. Yeah. You do. You say, well, I don't have no idols. Some of you will get more excited and worked up over a football game than I've ever seen you in church. Amen. Some of you will sit on video games and scream and holler and laugh and, and, and do all those things, but yet you come to church and you stand there like a statue. Why? What's wrong with us? I know this is a youth takeover, but this needs to be said today. I understand that you know, you're all coming expecting to have the gift, and they did an amazing job. But we also have to value the Word of God. And if we don't teach our youth the truth of the Word of God, we're missing it. That's right. I want no preacher to stand up here and be afraid to say hell or sin. Now, that's the world that we're living in today. But not here. It says, you burn incense to vanities, cause them to stumble in their ways. Watch this. The ancient paths to what? walk in pathways and not on a highway. Cause them to stumble away from the ancient paths. Let me tell you, I get a little bit frightened by some of the people that claim they have all these new revelations. Oh, God showed me this. And if you buy my book for $15.99, you can know about it too. Yes. Or send me a donation. I'll send you some holy oil or whatever it is. Do you know that we're standing right now on the shoulders of men and women who forged the ancient path for us? Now we have a choice. We can continue in the path or we can try to forge different paths. We live in a world that wants to forge different paths. But the Bible says straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Yes. You want to listen to some preachers that want to puff you up? That's okay. I like some of them too. But I love somebody too that's going to get in the Word and tell me what the truth of God's Word says. Yes. 
I stand on the shoulders of those who, who were that kept the ancient paths of not being ashamed to proclaim what God yes. said in his word. Not yes. being ashamed yes. to call sin, yes. sin. Not being ashamed to call evil, evil. Not being ashamed to stand up for what God says in his word. You might call it ancient. You might call it out of style. I don't really care. But it's the ancient path. And when you start to turn from that, like they did in this book of Jeremiah, when you start to turn to that, you are all of a sudden being placed in the potter's field and you're going to be destroyed. Bit heavy this morning. It's okay. They didn't look at the ancient past. The blueprint was already there. You know, the blueprint's already been laid for us by those who have gone on before us. And now there's a great cloud of witnesses that are watching us saying, Stick to the blueprint. But you don't understand. I got a new way. No, stick to the blueprint. I believe in the power of the cross. I believe in being baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen? I believe there's power in the name of Jesus. I believe in the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? We should know this song. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't want to be going down the ancient... I don't want to be going away from the ancient paths. The blueprint's already been laid. You hear me, young people. The blueprint's already there. And if the Lord tarries, and I have my doubts, but if he tarries, one day we're going to be handing you the same blueprint. Walk in the ancient paths. Walk in the old ways. There's an old song. Give me that old-time religion. Everybody remember that? It's good enough for me. It was good for Paul and Silas. It was good enough for me. Let's not stray from that. What happened is they were hopeless. They forgot about God. They burned incense. And watch what they did in verse number 18. Go ahead. 18, 18. Then they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us attack him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. One of the last things they did. They got hopeless, they burned incense, they went down, got away from the ancient path. And one of the last thing, they said, let's go against our preachers. Let's attack them. Let's attack the man of God. Let's go against Jeremiah. Let's go against the prophet. We are living in a culture right now where preachers are so disrespected. It used to be a respected trait. And I'm not blaming it all on society because some preachers have messed up big time too. Come on. I get that. Let me just tell you this. If God gives you a word for the church and he doesn't give me the same word, guess what? It's probably not from God. Yeah, right. Now some of you are going to get offended. I might as well just step on the toes all the way. Amen? You know what the problem is? Is sometimes... We're so used to doing it our way. We have developed independent spirits. And I've had people look at me, I don't care what you say, preacher. i got to go with what God tells me. And I think if God's telling you something that's going against me, it's not God. Because if I'm wrong, God deals with me directly. Amen? That scares me. It does. And people say, well, preachers, you're held to a higher standard. Hold more accountable. I get all that. But you're also held accountable how well you follow the leadership that God put in your life. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Everybody's for correction unless you're the one being corrected. Then you run out the door and then you're no good. Then talk about the preacher and he's worthless and he's that. Because I got corrected. As long as he was doing correcting somebody else, it's okay. Come on. Ooh. Amen. I'm just getting in all kind of trouble. I'm going to just keep going. Amen. Amen. But they started turning their heart against the men of God. These independent spirits. We don't listen to what the preacher says. The Bible says, let everything be done in decency and order. And you know what scares me? And I, I, this, this terrifies me. 
one day I stand before God and I give an account. I tell her more like, and they know this a long time ago, like, I'm sorry, I love you all, but you don't scare me. You don't. What terrifies me is I stand before God and I give an account. And that's why I pray, God, let the people of this church, let our hearts be knitted together. Let their hearts be like mine. Because I will tell you, there is not a preacher that's perfect. If you're looking for one, you're looking at the wrong one. You need to look to the Lord. Amen? Amen. But God places these shepherds there to help to guide you and shepherd you. And sometimes it's correction. Sometimes it's and sometimes you have to coddle a sheep and sometimes you have to break their legs. Yeah. And you can tell you what happens in the church 99% of the time when you gotta break a leg. They hobble out and never come back. Why? Why? Because we don't understand how it should be. We've lost it. We've lost the ancient paths. You know, when I grew up in church, I know you know this too, you did what the preacher said and you didn't ask questions. If he said, we ain't wearing sandals to church, you didn't wear sandals to church. You didn't have a list of things of why, give me, or you just did it. Because you knew they were watching out for your souls. Today, I don't care what he said. I'm going to do what I want to do because I'm going to do me. It's that independent spirit. That, 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 uh, let me just call it this. Jezebel spirit that's gotten a hold of us. And what happens, that will lead us to what? The potter's field. Where ultimately we will be shattered and destroyed. Come on, Pastor. Wow. Wow. Lord, make me. Yes, Lord. Mold me. Yes, Lord. Help me be what you want me to be. Yes, Lord. These are the stages that will lead you to the potter's field. To eternal damnation. Go to Luke 19.44. We'll wrap this up here shortly. I hope, I hope this is helping somebody today. Amen. Go ahead and read that. And level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you in one stone upon another. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. You did not know the time of your visitation. Because we got so comfortable. We got so comfortable with doing things the way we want to do it. He was saying, you missed your moment. You missed your time of visitation. The Lord spoke to me and said, tell them, get back on the wheel. Tell them. Come on. They may be chipped. They may be marred a little bit. They may have a few pieces missing, but if they would just get back on the wheel, I will mold them. I will rework them. If they're moldable and pliable, I will work on them. Come on, Romans 13, 11. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake. Somebody say awake. Now our salvation is near. Now, 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 now is the time, amen? Not tomorrow, not a week. Now is the time to get on the wheel. Away. Scripture says in Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. And sometimes the reality is we're just our worst, own worst enemy. Like the man who went to the construction site and he went to have lunch with his friends there and his co-workers and he opened his lunch box and he said baloney, baloney, baloney if I have to eat another baloney sandwich and his co-worker said well why don't you tell your wife to pack you a different type of sandwich he said I'm not married I pack my own lunch good boy Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. The truth is that sometimes we put the baloney in our own lives. It's us. We want to blame everybody else, but it's you. 
Point. The old saying, you point the finger at somebody, uh, he's pointing back at you. Three, right? Baloney, baloney. You pack your own baloney. Yeah, really? Let me give you one more little story. I think this is, then I'll, then I'll, I'll land this hopefully. There was a lady who went to her pastor and she says, I'm leaving the church. I can tell you I've heard that quite a few times. Sometimes they just leave and never answer your phone calls and won't ever get back with you. But anyway, then you just go tell everybody else how bad you are. But anyway, that comes with the job, right? Jeremiah dealt with it, so why not me, right? So she went and she said, I'm leaving the church. And he said, why? And she said, well, you don't understand. When I come to church, I see these young people on their cell phones. I see weird hairdos. I hear people gossiping in the foyers. And they're all just a bunch of hypocrites. And I just can't be a part of this no more. And the pastor said, can you just do one thing for me before you make your final decision? She said, yeah. So he took a glass, he filled it all the way up to the top, just, just a little bit full of top, full of water. And he said, I want you to just make two laps around the church, very carefully, holding this glass of water. And make sure none of it spills out on the carpet, but just walk around the church twice and bring it back to me. So she took the glass of water and thought, well, this is silly, but okay. I'm going to do it. So she walked around the church one time, walked around the church a second time, and not even an ounce, nothing fell out of that glass. And she came back and she said, here's your water. I did just as you told me to do. And he said, I just have a couple questions for you. He said, when you were walking around with that glass of water, did you see anybody on their phones? No. Did you see any kids with weird hairdos? No. Did you see or hear anybody gossiping? No. Was anybody living wrong? Did you see any of that? She said, well, well, no, because I was so focused on the glass and so focused that the water wouldn't fall. And he told her this. When you come to church, you should be that focused on God. So you don't fall. Jesus commanded us to follow him, not spirituality walk on what some other Christian does. It's my personal relationship. It's what happens when we lose our focus. We want to look at 